Good morning, LifePoint Crossing. So glad that you are here. Listen to the sounds of the congregation and the energy in this place this morning, which is greater than it may have appeared. I like that. I am a big fan of that. I am glad that you are here. Uh, this is week four of Meal Kit, and especially after last week, if you were here or if you weren't, we learned some real kinds of nuts and bolts to help you take some ingredients and make them into dinner. And now I know, I just know that you are all doing fantastic. You are chopping, you're cutting, you're sauteing, you're boiling, you're combining, you're taking all sorts of things and making them into wonderful things. I know you are, right? Maybe maybe it's a little bit optimistic of me to suggest that all of us in the span of three weeks have gone from the very beginning to incredible growth, okay? Maybe that's a little optimistic, but I also know that we're not all starting at the very beginning. And so wherever you are, I am optimistic, very truly, that even if right now at this moment you're not in the midst of a period of great growth, that at some point you will be, maybe in a couple months, maybe in a couple years, and the kinds of things that we'll talk about today will be able to help and interact with this. Because here's what happens, is you have gone, at least in my mind, for the next 30 minutes, you've gone from knowing just not really much of anything, like not even being sure if you were ever going to be able to do more than just order takeout, to now cooking up dinner like a champ. And you're just very, very amazed at how far you've come in such a short time, and this is really fantastic. In fact, some of you, you're having so much fun, you're cooking up things that aren't even in the meal kit. You're sautéing a hair scrunchie, you went, you, you broiled some, some old flip-flops, you boiled an egg timer. What? I know, I know you didn't boil an egg timer. Those are ridiculous examples. But listen, in terms of non-practical, non-helpful things, I have been to seminary, okay, which a lot of was very helpful. But I've been to seminary. If you don't even know what seminary is, that's just like grad school for pastors and Bible theology, all that kind of thing. And, and I've seen a lot of things. I've talked to a lot of people. I've been through a few stages in my own life. And something that I've seen time after time, again, as well as in my own life, is an incredible thing where when you learn a little bit, it can become very easy to, to look back and start to be impressed with how far you've come and this bit that you've learned to the point where maybe it's even hard to continue to look at where you should be going and remembering your goal. And so I don't know if this is why there's a picture of the finished product on the recipe card of every recipe card that comes in a meal kit, but I love that there is a picture of the finished product on the recipe card of every recipe card that comes in the meal kit, because that gives you something to shoot for. That's You know you're, you're not just chopping and, and combining or cooking or whatever. Everything that you're doing, every step, should be moving you closer to this picture of what you're after. So it might be really cool to boil an egg timer. I, probably not, I don't know. But it's not going to be particularly helpful in reaching your goal, right? And so it's very tragic. But this same thing happens with really just about anything in life, but including certainly Jesus and spirituality and the Bible and all of these things. And it, it, where a little bit of knowledge can go terribly, terribly wrong. And in fact, it's really very predictable. When I started seminary, first semester, they had us all take this class, and one of the things they had us do in this class was they had us read this little 40-page booklet that was called A Little Exercise for Young Theologians. Here's basically what this was, was a warning to those of us who were about to start taking some steps into the heights and depths of scripture and theology, that it has a, a way of kind of not making you awesome, but making you a terrible creature who nobody is going to want to be around. And this was such a recognized pattern, this guy wrote a booklet about it, and then the seminary said, yeah, we need to have everyone who steps in here read this right at the start. And this is really, it's that level of a consistent, recognized pattern, where instead of just being amazed by God and the wonderful things that you're learning and uncovering about him, you just kind of get frustrated with everybody else, 
Like, what's their problem? Why, why aren't they this impressed? Why, why did they never care enough to take the time to learn in the first place? And instead of making you awesome, it makes you just kind of like a jerk for Jesus. That's never, of course, the goal. And so it's vital to keep checking your progress against the picture of what it is that you're working toward every step of the way. You know Satan can use your knowledge every bit as well as he could use your ignorance. It happens too often. And so at each step, you keep going back to the picture of what you're shooting for and remembering your goal, which of course begs the question, so what's the goal? Well, like many things, it's, it's not easy, but it is fairly simple. For today, I'll sum it up as saying the goal is to grow in your love for God so that that then overflows into also love for people. Of course, on one level, the picture of that is Jesus himself was the embodiment of truth and love, and he also points to it really fairly explicitly in a very well-known conversation that's recorded in Matthew 22. This will be very familiar to some of you, where, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? It's a, really a great question, and Jesus replied, well, you must, okay, here it is, love the Lord your God with all of you, all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Whatever it is that you're doing for other people, if it isn't born out of some love for God, then it will die with you and them. It has to start with love for God. However, where the person asked, hey Jesus, what's your one favorite cookie? Jesus says, okay, well, I'm gonna reach into that cookie jar, I'm gonna grab two. And so he also says that the second is really even not less important, but equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So you can love God with all of your everything, but if at some point that isn't expressed also in love for people, then your dinner is going to miss something that's really, really vital. Like It's not that big of a deal if you create the perfect glaze and then there's no pork chop for it to go on, then that's just weird. There's supposed to be a pork chop and your dinner's really missing something, it's not going to be a success. So these are what we call the great commandments. And some of you knew that and were very familiar with that before we even brought them up here. They're up here probably a couple of times every year. And so you knew that, you're familiar with that, and you probably would have even guessed that that's what I was going to say. So you're feeling pretty good about that. Maybe some others of you, you didn't know this two minutes ago, but now you just learned something. You're like, okay. They ask Jesus, what's the most important commandment? He answers pretty straightforwardly. This is, okay, now I understand. Now I've, we call this the great commandment, Matthew 22. All right, good. Well, I just learned something, and you feel pretty good about that. I'm all for feeling good. It completely beats feeling bad. However, feeling good, it's not the goal. And it's amazing the way this is addressed in what we call 1 Corinthians chapter 8. As you may know, 1 Corinthians is a letter written by the person we call the Apostle Paul to the, the church, the believers in Jesus Christ, in the city called Corinth. And that was a, a church he had planted himself. He probably led most of these people to faith in Jesus personally. They knew each other. They had a relationship. And so um, he's, he's writing and he's answering some questions that they've had. And specifically, the question that he's answering as we pick up here has to do with eating meat that's been offered to idols, which is not something that we have as a situation in our world, in our society. However, he moves from that to something that is extremely relevant to us. And here's what he writes. He says, regarding the question about food that has been offered to idols. He says, yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue. So clearly there's been some prior back and forth here. And it seems as though the people in Corinth are banking very heavily on their knowledge that the food that's offered to idols, it's really just like any other food. There really is no moral or ethical or religious problem with eating food that's been offered to idols. They know that, and for what it's worth, Paul is actually going to agree with them about that. But for what it's worth it's maybe not really worth that much. And Paul makes clear that that's really not a particularly a high priority because he says, while knowledge, it, it makes us feel important, look, it's, it's love 
that strengthens the church. Knowledge, that makes us feel good. Okay, but love, well, that's going to actually accomplish good. And then he goes on and he kind of contrasts them again. I wish the screen was big enough to have both these on there at the same time. Uh, He says, anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. And so again, there we see it. We see, what are the two things he points to with love? Is Well, it strengthens the church. What's the church? Well, the church is people. Okay. And then love God, right? It's very similar to what Jesus was saying. Loving God, love people. It's, your knowledge is good. Your knowledge can be helpful. But if your knowledge isn't leading you to grow in love toward God and toward people, then maybe it's really not worth as much as you'd hoped it would. So hopefully, when the Corinthians read this letter 2,000 years ago, they learned a little something. And hopefully, when we see this here today, we we learn a little bit. But if that knowledge doesn't lead us to grow in our love for God and people, then it's maybe not the kind of growth that Jesus and Scripture really point us to. And it's, it's interesting the, the, something I feel like I've seen a lot of times just in my relatively short life, not that I'm, I mean, I'm definitely middle age, but in terms of thousands of years, I have not lived thousands of years, but it's always interesting to me when I see our world sort of catch up with things that have been in scripture for thousands of years in a variety of different ways. I feel like I see this in a lot of different ways, and it's, it's really kind of fun. But the, the dynamic that Paul's pointing to here is this idea that just a little bit of knowledge can really be very dangerous. This is now actually, as of 1999, a recognized and named phenomenon that I know I have seen in my life more times than I'd like to admit or talk about. And and it's really difficult and it's kind of terrifying because it's almost impossible to see when you're in the middle of it, but you sure can see it when you're looking back on it. That when you think you know the most probably that's really when you know very, very little. I talked a couple weeks ago about when I was in high school and I started playing guitar. I tried lifting weights for a couple of years because I thought if I got huge, then girls would dig me, but I didn't get huge and girls didn't dig me, so I started playing guitar instead. Uh, and uh, it might have actually appeared that that didn't work either, although, interesting sidebar, I believe the first person I ever played anything for was, in fact, my sister's friend, Laura who I really had no particular interest of that type in at that time, but have had great interest in for many years now. So maybe that did work. Just kind of a fun sidebar. But I started playing guitar, and if you know or if you don't, it's one of those instruments where just a little bit can kind of take you quite a long way. You can, you can pick up a guitar, learn a few things, and practice and play, and within a relatively short amount of time, you can make some stuff sound at least fairly recognizable. And so I learned, and I played, and I really enjoyed it. I did, you know, whenever I could. It became a big part of my life. And in a short time, a guitar went from being just an unfathomable mystery, if you look and all you see are strings and metal pieces that all look alike and you don't understand what any of it means to something that I felt like I really kind of understood fairly well. And of course, all of my friends who did not play guitar, and to them the guitar was also an unfathomable mystery, they thought that I was very impressive because I could play some things. To add to this, just historically, this was in the mid-90s where if you were there or, or if you know and remember or somehow kids these days know all of these things, I don't even know how, but during this period of time, this was about when Nirvana was kind of king of rock radio. And if you know, Nirvana was never known for their musical sophistication. If anything, they were known for their musical simplicity bordering on sloppiness. And so I was there, and I was like, well, I could play anything Nirvana. And what I thought that meant is that they were a terrible band and I was a better musician. Then in college, I had a friend who had a guitar book that showed you how to play the whole album of Def Leppard's Hysteria. Okay, Now, this was already very dated at the time, but we all remembered it, and I wanted to play whatever I could. I just liked learning to play stuff. So I got a hold of that, and I flipped through, of course, to pour some sugar on me. And I remember when I saw the guitar solo, I was absolutely horrified. Almost the whole thing is, not kidding, two notes. Do you remember what it sounds like? 
dun 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 and they had sold millions of albums and successfully toured the world multiple times. I was trying to impress girls in my dorm room, mostly failing, and I was the one being elitist about it. <laughs> I can only talk about it because it's almost 30 years ago, right? If this was last week, I'd be still too embarrassed. But then eventually you move into a situation where I was able to see what genuine proficiency looked and sounded like, and then I realized how far I had to go, but I had to learn a little bit more to even learn how much there was to learn. And so the term that's been used from, for this since 1999 is the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is what it looks like on a graph, and this should terrify you. Because what this means is that when we learn just a little bit about something, we feel like we've learned an enormous amount, and we're very, very confident in that. It's very, very easy and natural for us to look at and be impressed with the little bit that we've learned instead of being able to look and see it at how far we have to go. We don't even know that's there. You have to continue, and, and then if you do well, and you do continue, and you move along, maybe even approaching something for a, considered like a level of expertise, at that point, well, now you can have a very, very realistic picture of the fact that, okay, yes, I have come a great distance, but you've come through the process, so now you also, you remember what it was like when you thought you were an expert, and then you learned that you, in fact, were an idiot, and how painful that was, and so you've gained some perspective and some humility along the way, and so this is why, really, most of the time, if you've noticed, when there's somebody who's a genuine expert in something, they're really genuinely not that impressed with themselves. They have a reasonable level of confidence in who they are and what they've learned, but they also maintain a certain level of humility and understanding the process that they've come through and how much there is that they still don't know. This is what a little bit of knowledge can do. And another last seminary story for today, but I remember there was, when I was in seminary, there was a well-known professor who was very old, who was about to retire. If you don't know what kind of person is a seminary professor, I had taken a class from this, from this man, uh, one of the books we used, he had written. It was actually, coincidentally, what a lot of last week's message was based on. Um, he had also, he had major commentaries published in, from major commentary sets from two different books. From, he, had, he wrote one on Mark and one on Luke. He had sat on at least one major English translation committee. That means when you open your Bible or your Bible app, he was a part of producing that and giving you that in English. This is a top-level, world-class level expert. And I will always remember, toward the end of that year, as his retirement approached, he was invited to be a chapel speaker. And as he got up and he began to, to talk, he, he told us that he'd chosen to speak from John 3.16. And then he acknowledged that in doing so, that that, really, that was really kind of out of his lane. That was not really his, his area of expertise because really he was an expert in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We all sat there, wide-eyed 25-year-olds, Every one of us feeling like we were completely qualified to talk about John 3.16 at the drop of a hat. And on some level we were, but here he was, the world-class expert, acknowledging that, yeah, you know, this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about this, but let me just acknowledge before I do that like, there are some people here who really know a lot more about this than I do. And so I love the way that Paul put that in verse 2, that when you think you know all of the answers, you really don't know very much. And here's why that's true, is because when we think we know all the answers, the only reason we think we know all the answers is because we aren't even aware of most of the questions. You learn a little bit more, and then you start to realize how much there is 
to learn. And so learning the answers can be helpful. I'm a learner. I'm always reading and, and asking questions and trying to learn more. It can be helpful. But your goal isn't to be the seminary professor who spends his life answering questions that you didn't even know were questions. And for what it's worth, neither was his. Your goal is to grow in love for God and for people. And if your learning isn't helping you make progress toward that goal, then it really isn't healthy. That might not be the kind of growth that Jesus and Scripture are pointing us toward, even if what we're learning is Jesus in Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul's writing about the church being, being built up and equipped, and he writes this. He says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that, that we'll be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Knowledge has a part in maturity. You have to have a certain level of knowledge, a certain amount of knowledge that can be, that can be really good, that can be beneficial. But he, and he says, then we, we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and excuse me, blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Right? You, you need to know some things that's, that's really helpful. But here's what we're going to do. Instead, here's, we will speak the truth, okay, yes, in love, growing, right, what we're talking about, growing, how and toward what, in every way, in, in truth and in love, more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Truth is is part of the goal. Truth is vital. If your love for God, if, if that God isn't based in truth, then your love for him is going to be horribly misdirected. If your love toward people isn't expressed in ways that are helpful and beneficial in truth and in reality, then they're going to be of very little or, or maybe even negative value. Truth is vital. You don't get to the knowledge without truth. And, and so, you want that, but it's not the goal. Becoming like Christ is the goal. He is the embodiment of truth in love. Are you looking more like the picture on the card? And if you're not, it might be time to, to reassess whether you're really growing and, and doing or if you're just knowing and feeling good. We started in 1 Corinthians 8, and he's answering questions. He kind of covers a lot of ground over the next few chapters, but he's also kind of beating on a very similar drum when he comes around about five chapters later to some very well-known words. He says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, I don't even know what that means. The language of angels, I have no idea. But didn't love others? I would only be, all, all of this impressive speech, it would be just meaningless noise, a, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, in the next chapter, he's going to say to desire the gift of prophecy. He says, well, if I had that, okay, but not only that, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and not even just that. And if I had such faith, we want faith is good. We, we promote faith. If I had such faith that I could move mountains, all of these, but didn't love others, I would be like still pretty good. It's nothing. So if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, what would I have gained? would gain nothing. I hope you're learning. I hope you're growing. And it's hard to grow without learning, but it's easy to learn without growing. And so let's remember the goal is to become more like the picture of Jesus Christ in love for God, overflowing into love for people. Jesus had all knowledge. You know what we remember him for? Because he loved me.
and what that meant. All right, let's pray, guys. Father, thank you so much that Jesus didn't stop with just knowledge, but that he proceeded in love for me, for everybody here, for anybody and everybody who would ever call on his name. Thank you that not only did he give his life in love for us, but that he gives us that picture to strive for, even in this world, to be more like him, to grow into a picture of truth in love that he has provided for us and that we still see so clearly 2,000 years later here on the other side of the world. And if you're here or, or watching online, wherever you are, and maybe you've never taken that first step to respond to Jesus' love, that's, that's what it is, is just responding to his love. The idea of, of what he did and what he went through and gave up for us, for you, is more than we can go into for this moment in this message. But it was because he loves you. And he came and died and took the just punishment for your sin and wrongdoing so that you could take his righteousness, be adopted as a child of God and his family forever. Listen, if that's you right where you sit or, or watch, you can say out loud or online, just, just pray even in your heart and, and talk to God. He'll hear you say, God, I believe that Jesus Christ came and died and resurrected so I could be forgiven and adopted as a child in your family. Please come into my life. Forgive me and adopt me. Begin to make me into the person you created me to be and give me the life that you have for me. If you just prayed a prayer like that for the first time, it's not the words or the prayer that saves you. It's you put your faith in Jesus and God's grace comes to you through that. And that's where you're forgiven in a new spiritual creature. Listen, if the best thing, the best thing you can do is reach out to, to myself or to the church in the lobby or send us a message online, whatever it is, so that we can help guide you down some good first steps that will lead you toward the life that God has for you, okay, for the rest of us. This is probably a message that everybody knew, but it's one of the things that is so easy to lose sight of when we're in the process of just whatever it is we're in the process of. Right now, will you, between yourself and the Spirit of God, just commit to following Him and to recalibrating your life and your growth, not away from learning, but not toward learning, but toward becoming toward allowing him to transform you into the person who he's created you to be, which is someone who looks a lot more like Jesus. Father, we ask that you would be powerfully at work in each one of us here today. Indeed, conforming us, changing us, transforming us in, from the, the people who we can be or can make ourselves into, into the person who you would make us into which is that image of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.